Hello everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to the first screencast in our series on presuppositions. Uh, presuppositions are one of the most important topics in all of semantics and pragmatics. At a high level in this course, we've seen so far two major ways that people can convey meaning in language, with entailed content, that is with the core of the semantics of the language, and with conversational implicatures. Presuppositions introduce a third major way that content can come across and as we'll see, it's a quite different method from the first two with quite different linguistic and social consequences as a result. The full plot for this unit is given in this overview here, and this screencast is going to cover just the first three topics. Together, those topics help to begin to convey what presuppositions are like, and they begin to orient our own discussions towards semantic presuppositions, that is, presuppositions that we seem to find encoded in the conventional semantic content of words and constructions. And then in subsequent screencasts, we'll study the behavior of presuppositions in discourse, and we'll define some tests for identifying presuppositions in the wild. And that'll set us up nicely for some case studies of presuppositional content. And then we'll close by broadening, by connecting presuppositions to the topic of political framing. All right, so that's the full plan. Let's dive in. To start, I just want to offer some intuitive definitions of presupposition. In the most general terms, we say that the presuppositions of an utterance are the pieces of information that the speaker assumes, or acts as if they assume, in order for their utterance to be meaningful in the current context. And the hedge there is important. The speaker assumes, or acts as if they assume. People can be disingenuous with presuppositions, and that turns out to be especially manipulative in many cases, as we'll see. Finally, note that this broad characterization encompasses everything from general conversational norms to the particulars of how specific linguistic expressions are construed. And indeed, it's common to break the notion of presupposition down into two very broad classes. The first are the pragmatic presuppositions. Pragmatic presuppositions include the preconditions for linguistic interaction, the norms of turn-taking and dialogue, and more particularized information about conversational plans and goals. So this is obviously very broad. Consider, for example, the mutual public knowledge that we're speaking the same language. That's a pragmatic presupposition that runs very deep. Consider also the norms of being in a college classroom. Those differ considerably from the norms on a basketball court or in a court of law. The tenets governing all these things could be regarded as pragmatic presuppositions, and they'll shape linguistic and non-linguistic behavior. I would say that the clearest instances of pragmatic presuppositions are those that can't easily be traced to specific words or phrases, but rather seem to arise from more general properties of the context and the expectations of the discourse participants. And that begins to establish a nice contrast with the presuppositions that we'll focus on, the semantic presuppositions. These are sometimes called conventional presuppositions or even lexical presuppositions. And we're going to hypothesize that these are part of the encoded meanings of specific words and constructions. Such things are often called presupposition triggers. So whereas pragmatic presuppositions are sort of ambient in general, the presuppositions associated with words and constructions tend to be fairly tightly defined. And of course, they provide a chance for us to see how those meanings interact with the rest of language. Now, there are lots and lots of presupposition triggers in all languages, so I can't possibly enumerate them. But I've given here a few representative examples to help us start to get a feel for what presuppositions are like. Consider first the definite article as used in a sentence like, the dog is grumpy. The definite article is the presupposition trigger. And so we say that this sentence presupposes that there is a unique salient dog D. And then we can say that it asserts, in a semantic sense, that D is grumpy. Possessives are also generally triggers, and they do something similar to what the does. Confirm your eBay transaction. This is an example of a spam email technique. This presupposes that the recipient has an eBay transaction, and it requests that the recipient confirm that transaction somehow. And this is effective because... If you happen to have an eBay transaction, then it seems like a normal sort of request. And if you don't have one, you might still accommodate that you do and then do something that makes the spammer happy. The verb quit is a presupposition trigger. In Sam quit smoking, we have a presupposition that Sam smoked in the past and an assertion that Sam does not smoke at present. The clause embedding verb realize seems to be a sort of presupposition trigger. 
The sentence Ed realizes that it is Wednesday, presupposes that it's Wednesday, and asserts that Ed is aware of this. This next example is a bit trickier. The uh, it was X locution, as in it was Joan, is what linguists call a cleft construction, and quite generally, clefts carry presuppositions. In the sentence, it was Joan who stole the cookies, we have a presupposition that someone stole the cookies and an assertion that Joan is the culprit. I think why questions generally presuppose their clausal content. If you're a defendant in court and the lawyer asks you, why did you murder Professor Jones? You should refuse to answer. The question presupposes that you're guilty of murder and simply queries your reasons. Presuppositions can also interact in very complex ways with intonational focus. Here's a quick illustration of that. In the sentence, Joan likes pizza too, with focus on Joan, our trigger is the additive particle too, and with this focus pattern, we have a presupposition that some salient entity other than Joan likes spinach. And the assertion is just the sentence content, Joan likes spinach. Notice that if we change the focus, as in Joan likes spinach too, then the presupposition changes to something like there's a unique salient entity other than spinach that Joan likes. The assertion remains the same. Incidentally, Mitch Hedberg actually has a joke about this. Um, every time I go and shave, I assume there's someone else on the planet shaving. So I say, I'm going to go shave too. Now, this doesn't quite work for me because the other person referenced isn't salient enough, but maybe that's why the joke is funny. Anyway, I collected a few other cases at the bottom here. These are somewhat harder to make sense of. For the spam email subject, are you really looking for a job? I can tell there's a presupposition triggered by really, but I can't really spell out what the presupposition is. It, it seems to signal that I did something to indicate that I was looking for a job, and the sentence questions my commitment at, in that effort. But that's only part of the complex thing that really is doing here. I do, though, know that it seems to trigger some kind of presupposition. This next one is just a funny insult. Julia Gong sent this in to me. It's from a fortune cookie. You deserve respect and will eventually get it. And this presupposes that I don't currently get respect. At least it says I deserve some. I've already complained to you about the New York Times and its manipulations with who wants to go swimming. We do too. This is actually related to why Mitch Hedberg's joke is a bit off for me. It can't be just anyone who wants to go swimming. It has to be someone salient. And I'm the only candidate as the reader of the headline, and I didn't make such a commitment to wanting to go swimming, and that's why it's irksome. In my Pragmatics Joke screencast, I played the scene where the characters from High Fidelity are debating whether yet has a particular presupposition. Does I haven't seen Evil Dead 2 yet presuppose that the speaker will see the movie? I'm not sure, but it seems plausible that it does. And finally, I love the headline, There is no God and Dawkins is his prophet. This is actually from a review that I can't find on the web anymore, but if I remember correctly, it was a review of a Dawkins book, and the reviewer was a religious figure, and the point of the review was that Dawkins seems to minimize a role for religion in science, but in doing so, he actually makes a case that religion is centrally important to science. And so the conflicting presuppositions of the title capture all of that elegantly. In this context, the phrase, his prophet, clearly presupposes the existence of God, and yet the first sentence denies that presupposition, which is more or less a summary of the reviewer's position of Dawkins' book. All right, final topic for this screencast, accommodation. This is really fundamental to how presuppositions work. First, I want to say that according to the theory we'll offer, Presuppositions should fail completely if they're not already part of the shared common ground of the discourse participants. So if we were strict about that, and I said my dog is energetic, and I hadn't first established with you publicly that I have a dog, then my utterance would collapse and everyone's head would explode or something. Of course, this is not really what happens. Rather, the truth is that speakers routinely presuppose things that have not already been established as part of the common ground, and when they do this, they're implicitly asking the other discourse participants to accommodate that information by adding it to the common ground, or at least by adding to the common ground that the speaker is publicly committed to that information for the purposes of the current interaction. The ease with which accommodation happens depends on a great many factors. For example, if the speaker is known to be knowledgeable and trustworthy and the information is straightforward, then accommodation is likely to be easy. Thus, if I say to you, my dog is energetic, even out of the blue, you'll accommodate that I have a dog and then on that basis interpret my sentence. In this case, it might be rather plodding of me to say, 
I have a dog and my dog is energetic. And it would be rather obstinate of you to respond with to my dog is energetic with, hey, you didn't first establish that you have a dog, presupposition failure. However, where the content gets more controversial or surprising, we might start to see some of that. If you tell me my giraffe ate my homework, I won't just accommodate the content. I might accommodate that you believe you have a giraffe or wish me to believe that you had a giraffe, but I won't accommodate that you do unless you live on a wildlife preserve or something. So in this case, I might say, hey, wait a second, you didn't tell me you had a giraffe. But this is an unusual case. By and large, we accommodate pretty automatically most of the time. Why do we do it? I like this characterization from Thomason. Accommodation is acting to remove obstacles to achieve desires or goals that we attribute to others. And he goes on to discuss how the routine nature of accommodation doesn't make it any less important. He writes, the case in which a shopkeeper regularly marks off his goods for various ad hoc reasons is different from the case in which the goods have no price at all, even though the cash register receipts may be the same for the two cases. In the one case, there's a rule established by a marked price, and in the other, there is not. In other words, the routine nature of accommodation might in fact be part of why it's meaningful. Take the case of a sign at a hotel pool that says we regret that the pool is closed. I think regret is a presupposition trigger. It presupposes that its complement cause is true. Okay, but if I go down to the hotel pool in my swim trunks and with my towel eager to get in the water, then it's obvious that the presupposition here isn't part of my common ground with the hotel. So why did they do this? I think they're acting as if their regret is really the important thing, and they're doing it by asking me to accommodate the important information, even as they foreground their own regret. We can also see accommodation interact with quality in interesting ways. Take the case of the politician who says, I just know we're going to win the election. I think no at least tends to presuppose its complement cause is true. Okay, but the politician can't be in a position to know that they'll win. I think their presupposing that they'll win is a, as a kind of rhetorical device to convey extreme confidence. And this kind of behavior with no is actually very common, and so we'll return to it in a short case study later on and look, look at more cases like this. Finally, as I've mentioned before, one can be outright manipulative with accommodation. For confirm your eBay transaction, there are a few scenarios. If you do have such a transaction, the spammer doesn't know it, but they got lucky and you might get yourself into trouble. If you don't have such a transaction, you might still accommodate that you do because accommodation is so automatic and so crucial to even understanding the sentence. And then you'll get yourself into trouble again via accommodation. Right, so presuppositions and presupposition accommodation, these are powerful linguistic forces. And we'll turn next to some techniques for more systematically identifying these forces when they're at work in our language.